Good afternoon. Thank you to all of you who are with us here in person in West Des Moines and to those who are watching virtually around the country. We're generally thankful and glad you've chosen to join us for what we think will be a great conversation with two very special guests, Jerry and Nancy Foster. I'm Kent Kramer. I'm fortunate to serve as the Chief Investment Officer for Foster Group. And today I'll be directing our conversation around generosity. Jerry founded Foster Group in 1989 and currently serves as the company's board chairman. Jerry is a popular speaker at leadership and business conferences, both in the U.S. and internationally, and has served on various boards around the country. He has written articles for numerous publications and is the author of the book Life Focus, Achieving a Life of Purpose and Influence. Tonight, though, in our conversation about generosity, we'll be hearing not only from Jerry, but also from his wife, Nancy maybe the better half. As we'll hear, Jerry and Nancy have always been passionate about helping people. They met in Chicago where Jerry, after graduating from Iowa State University, was serving in an inner city ministry for at-risk youth in a very tough neighborhood. Nancy, originally from Michigan, was there as well, working in Chicago as a nurse. Over the years, they have worked in many places and with many organizations. One opportunity took them to Guatemala, where they have assisted local leaders in the village of El Rosario in building a healthy economic infrastructure. Today, they remain very engaged together, including serving on various boards. They have a shared passion for helping people caught in the cycle of poverty. Their desire is for people to experience new opportunities for sustainable life change. Jerry and Nancy have been married for 45 years. For 22 of those years, they were speakers with Family Life's Weekend to Remember conferences. They have four grown children and 15 grandchildren. They have also cared for multiple foster children. I've had the opportunity to get to know Jerry and Nancy fairly well during my 23 years at Foster Group. They demonstrate generosity in their family, in their community, and in just about everything and everyone they touch. Our vision statement at Foster Group is to encourage lives of meaning and generosity for our team, our clients, and our communities. This vision really reflects the priorities and life stories of Jerry and Nancy. This is going to be a great conversation, so please join me in welcoming our special guests, Jerry and Nancy Foster. Thank you for coming, everyone. We're glad you're here this afternoon. Uh, we're going to have a great conversation, we think, uh, about generosity. There's a number of people here in West Des Moines, and I know there's some people watching online as well. So uh, along the way, today there'll be some maybe questions you might like to ask, and there's going to be a number on the screen, uh, so you can text those, and then later on we'll have a little time for question and answer, hopefully, if time allows. So the conversation's about generosity today, and, uh, you know, it's always interesting to me to start with a definition. Words like that, it's like, what do they mean? If we look it up in the, the Merriam-Webster, they define generosity as liberal in giving. And then they give some synonyms like open-handed, big-hearted, charitable, unselfish. And for those of you who like big words, one of their synonyms is munis munificent. There, I said it for the second time. Wow. Um, anyway, so Jerry and Nancy, how would you guys, I mean, you've had this journey of generosity. You've thought about it. You've engaged in it. How would you define generosity? Well, we, we got that question ahead of time, so I looked it up, too, and uh, I, um, I like that word open-handed. I mean, that, that's such a great word picture because the antithesis of open-handed is tight fist. And so if you've got something that you, uh, that you own that you want to give away, but you're holding it like this, you know, you're, there's, con there's an element of control as opposed to the open-handed is just uh, clear of any string, no strings attached. And so I think it's just, a, it's just a great word picture. So I, I was really drawn to that one. Uh, the other part of that I guess I was drawn to is that um, you know, generosity is really, it's an issue of the heart. It's, it's not what we give or where we give as much as why we give. And I, I think if we spend the time understanding why it is we want to give, I think we're going to have a, a much better chance of being able to connect in this whole generosity space and really do that open-handedly. So that's you know, kind of some thoughts I had of it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I was thinking about that too, that it is a heart condition, but sometimes for me, it just starts in the brain as a conscious decision to do the next right thing. So it's not really engaged my heart yet. And I wondered, what is the secret to getting it into the heart? And I came up with that it was gratitude. So once I realized how grateful I am for my life and my, um, how well cared for I am, then it makes me want to pay it forward and do things for other people. So gratitude. That's 
fantastic. So you don't get to this point without a background. Some questions that are fun to hear about is, where did this, where do you think some of these uh, th kind of interests in generosity or living a generous lifestyle, how did that start in your life? Where would you track it back to? Okay, well, I, before, before we go there, I, I just have to have a, put out a disclaimer for Nancy and I, because uh, we're, we're not up here because we've achieved generosity and we're the experts on this. Uh, this is a journey for us. Uh, we got lots of questions. We've done things, a lot of things wrong. Uh, we've tried some things that have worked. Uh, so it's a little bit humbling to be up here telling our story, but since that's what the topic is, mm. and you asked the question, I guess we have to answer the question on that. But I wanted to say up front, we're, we're not the experts. But when I think about where it comes, back to your question, uh, it starts for, I think it starts for me, there's, a, there's an element of right, faith. Faith, you know, many of you know us, know me, and so faith is a big part of what we do. So that, that creates the foundation for us, just about everything we do. But when I go beyond that, I think about our life experience and how it's modeled for us. My dad was, uh, he was involved in everything in the city and the schools and nonprofits. Uh, he took on two young boys uh, who lost a father and he, he mentored them all the way through uh, junior high and high school and to their graduation. And uh, he was just the kind of guy that was, when he uh, grabbed a hold of something, he was all in. And I think that kind of established a real foundation for me. Uh, in terms of how I look at generosity. Yeah. Um, I saw some moments of generosity in my family too, but I grew up with a mentally ill mother. So she had bipolar, and back then they only could treat her with major tranquilizers. So it was really this up and down rocky childhood. So I just tried to escape that and spent almost every weekend with my girlfriend at her house. And her family took me in like a daughter. They, they did everything for me, including my high school graduation party. I would not have had one if not for them. But they just treated me as one of their own. Um, their mud, her, my friend's mother would sew for me if she sewed for my friend. And uh, she just modeled how fun it was to be a pediatric nurse. And ironically, that's what I became as well. So anyways, I, I just credit that family for helping me survive one of those imperfect childhoods. Mm. Yeah, so two interesting paths. You guys come together in Chicago. How did those experiences work, or how did that get brought into your marriage, this idea of generosity? Yeah, I, I, I think having uh, similar experiences and seeing generosity modeled for us, um, that, that helped us kind of, when we came together and got married, we had a common, kind of a common foundation and a belief in that. So it made it really easy. It was just a natural thing for us to kind of to, to work into that. And, and it happened in a lot of different ways. I mean, uh, we didn't have a lot of money then, so we were, you know, we gave our time. Uh, our kids were involved, uh, you know, when they got into high school, junior high and high school, um, we, the, the school we were at lived out in Adel, and they needed a, a youth group to, to start out there. And so we started the Fellowship of Christian Athletes there. And we had over 100 kids coming every week uh, to that and did a lot of things in our home. And we just we just kind of got drawn into that uh, naturally. Um, and then we started, when we started our, our, when we got married, one of the first things we did is we established the, you know, uh, just a, a foundational principle that we were gonna give. And we would do that, you know, we'd do that very uh, diligently. And we didn't have, have much money to give them, but we did. We were, so we just set some goals and we did it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I think it was so modeled for me to take in an extra child because I was the extra child that our kids had friends over all the time. It was just the common thing to do. So when I got asked a few times to host an exchange student, we said yes, and we hosted three from Colombia, Brazil, and Japan. And then um, I, got, I worked at the Blank Children's Hospital doing physicals on kids that were going to be placed into foster homes. And from that, I was exposed to foster care. And over the years, we took seven foster children in. It just seemed like the right thing to give back. So anyways, um, I think I had that broken heart for the brokenhearted child. And Jerry just did the right thing beside me. <laughs> he got dragged into it. I just followed her. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, so Nancy, I'm going to kind of take that a little bit further, because I know around this fostering and other things, when we look at the picture of your family, it's obviously yeah. had an impact. Yeah. So, Tell us just a little bit more about Right. Well, so I worked at that clinic, and when the social workers would bring the kids in for 
physicals, I just asked so many questions. She's like, oh, this one should be interested in foster care. So she would work me over for months and say, you should do this sometime. <laughs> I'm like, oh, I could never do that. Love them and send them home. It just isn't for me. Well, one day I was collecting a urine specimen on this little girl, maybe four years old, and she just bursts into tears and she grabs my legs, holding on so tight that nobody could take her. She was terrified of what was going to happen to her next. And at that point I realized, who was I to say that this little girl had something too scary for me to help her with? Who was I to say that the home she needed couldn't be my home? And so I went home and Jerry had to get a long conversation on that one. <laughs> and suddenly we we're taking classes for foster parenting. And um, yeah, so I would say uh, the exciting part of it all though is that our last placement was a two and a half month old little baby girl who was born on my birthday and she became our fourth child. So best birthday present ever. I, I still remember the call. I was in a, in a meeting with a client and uh, Janet, sister, came and said, yeah, you need, Nancy's on the phone. I said, just tell her I'll call her back. She said, no, you need to take the call now. <laughs> so I took the call now. She said, are you sitting down? And so, uh, so that's how it happened. We got our fourth child. So a week later, we had a crib in our house and mm -hmm. another, another child. Yeah. It was awesome. Mm -hmm. You know, that's so great. I, when we were initially talking about this conversation, I think sometimes with generosity, we just tend to immediately think about it, especially with a firm like Foster Group, you want to put it in financial terms. Mm -hmm. And when I think about your stories, kind of how they've come along, a lot of things that you did that displayed generosity early on, really, were not about money, mm -hmm. uh, but about how you give to other people. You know, mm -hmm. you bring other people in your family, and your lives, your family's lives. Those are, those are fantastic. Jerry, you mentioned early on that kind of faith had a part of this, and there was something aspirational about setting goals, especially as it related to, to financial giving. Talk a little bit about that. Yeah, so uh, when we started, we just, we talked about it and decided we were gonna kind of go for that traditional 10% was gonna be our goal. I'm a goals-minded person, so it's a nice thing to shoot for. But when we first got married, I was teaching and we had twins right, you know, fairly soon and, and, and things, you know, we started up to our neck and a whole lot of debt. And so we didn't have a lot of extra money, but we just were determined that we were going to try to create that discipline. So I, I don't think there was probably very many weeks that we didn't do something, but sometimes it was just dollars, dollars. And uh, but we kept doing it. And our our goal was 10 percent. That's not a mandate. That was just aspirational on our part. But when we hit that 10 percent, you know, then we started talking and said, OK, we've hit the 10. Now what do we want to do? And so it, you know, it became aspirational for us to just keep uh, challenging ourselves to, to keep going higher. And so, you know, that, that's how it happened. I think one thing I know about you in your, in your book, too, you talk about small steps kind of creating larger changes down the road, vector changes. So when you look back, you think about those initial small steps. How did those small starts kind of contribute or get you going to where you are today? Well, they just, I mean, they, they happened just, they, they're right in front of us. I mean, we didn't, we just had to live and exist and look around us and, and the opportunities were there and so we just started doing them and but but they were like I said at the beginning mostly non-financial what I think what we learned really early in our marriage was uh, what it looked like what did it look like to just say yes to things instead of always having a reason to say no it's really easy for us to say no I you know, I'm you know, when some opportunity comes back, my, my human nature says, no, I don't have the time. And we just start challenging ourselves, saying, like Nancy with the foster care, do we really want to say no? Mm -hmm. And so, you know, that, that, that's what kind of how it kind of happened. Right. Well, I was thinking, for almost everything good I've ever done, I've backed into it. I'm, I have never been one to say, wow, I'd like to do that. It's like, no, I got four kids. I'm busy with the dishes and laundry, so I'm not going to look for anything else. Jerry might be the goal-minded one that would come up with an idea and go for it. But for me, I never looked for anything more to do. I backed into everything, backed into foster care, backed into exchange students. And so I don't take any credit for anything except the yes 
that I finally would break down and say yes. So like four years ago, Foster Group sponsored a, um, an event for a, it was a fundraiser for an orphanage in Africa. And at that event, I met a young lady, 25 years old from South Sudan, who had just come to that. And we had a conversation about a time I lived in Liberia. And so we disconnected and she said, could I have your phone number? And I said, yes. And then in that phone number, she said, she calls me, she says, you want to have dinner? And I said, yes. And so again, I, I never pursued these things. They just happened to me and they turned into amazing things. So saying yes, um, now we're friends with her and that's led us to um, know many people in her community. We actually mentor about eight of these South Sudanese really tall big guys and girls, <laughs> and they're amazing. But a side note to that is um, the day after Thanksgiving, Esther will have her tribal wedding ceremony where the two families come together from the different tribes and they decide how many cows she's worth, okay? I'm just saying this is a new thing for me. We didn't have to do that with our kids. But the, <laughs> the cows will actually come down into a dollar value and her fiance will have to pay that to her family. So he's working a couple jobs now to come up with the dowry, and that's a stressful but important thing in their culture. So we're learning a lot about that. But the next day will be her big celebration with hundreds of people, and she's asked Jerry to speak on behalf of her because her father died five months after we met her. And so he has that great opportunity to speak like a dad. So. Anyways, just saying yes to a dinner has opened the door to an amazing cultural journey for us. That's fantastic. Mm -hmm. So I'm thinking, I just had this thought, as a father of four daughters who are now all thankfully married, <laughs> Good I'm job. just translating that into cows. Yeah, like, yeah. I don't think Good I, luck with that. Yeah, I don't think I really... <laughs> yeah, that, that won't have that conversation. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that, that'll mm -hmm. be interesting because that'll, that'll be the, the two families and they'll all be in us, so it'll be mm -hmm. these, all these Africans and us, and the whole thing will be done in Dinka and whatever other Arabic, Arabic and, mm -hmm. and we'll just be there. So it, yeah. you don't have to go very far to, to go to another country. Yeah. Just down, you know, downtown. Mm -hmm. <laughs> right. Well, that's a fun story, but not all of your stories about generosity really started happily. I know one in particular that I think has really had a profound kind of I don't want to say directional change, but it really kind of propelled you to become even more intentional about how you give. And this is really centered around, Jerry, when you were diagnosed with uh, cancer in your yeah. eye. Yeah. I remember I was actually in Iowa City yeah, sure. with one of my daughters, uh, getting her ready to go to college, the first time that you were kind of coming down very quickly to the yeah. hospital there to start a treatment that you were not looking forward to. Yeah, no, I remember you hadn't that. imagined. Yeah. I remember that day we didn't know we didn't know a lot when I saw you and we were yeah. it was a crazy day but yeah so I was diagnosed in 2010 with uh, a very rare form of uh, eye cancer uh, only six in a million people get it it has a 50 percent mortality uh, when it metastasizes it goes from the eye to the liver 90 some percent of the time so it's a it's a pretty deadly cancer and um, and so uh, there's no they, they say there's no cure for it it's just a matter of if and when the cells metastasize, then th that's what you're looking at. And so, um, you know, that, that day changed a lot for us in terms of the way we look at a lot of things, the way we look at life. It, it changed the way we look at investing a little bit. Uh, we had never, we, we kind of lived uh, in a, our own lane when it comes to investing. We, there were a lot of other people we felt that were contributing to to universities and to medical, and we, we had our lane, and so we were just real comfortable not doing that because there was a lot of people who did. Uh, but that changed that day, and um, so let me put this story into context. Um, I'm an Iowa State grad, and I, in fact, I was psi at Iowa State, so I bleed cardinal and gold, okay? And so, uh, so I've nev we have never given a, any money to any uh, higher institution at all. The first check that I wrote to a, to a higher institution was to the University of Iowa Foundation. And I, you know, I, I remember, just that right now. Yeah, yeah, we, yeah, so I did it for my donor advice fund, you know, and I remember all you had to do in your donor advice fund is kind of click, click a button. I remember just, you know, okay, you know you, no, Sam, no, no, no. But, uh, you know, it was really hard, but it, it, you know, we had a, Doctor, we were investing in who was who was doing research for a particular kind of cancer, 
and suddenly our passions and interests changed. And so that, that's what happens with investing is that, you know, it, your passions will really begin to guide you. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Right. Nancy, I, I, we've talked a little bit about this, and I know you kind of had a path around how you're feeling about, you know, diagnosis, but also generosity. Yeah. What, right. Kind of tell us about that. Yeah. There's some interesting steps that you went through there. I know. It was overwhelming for me to think that I had a 50-50 chance of growing old with this guy. You know, that most of them didn't survive five years. So I was kind of in survival mode of imagining my life as a widow. What would I do? And so our first donation was really a lot more of a selfish decision. It wasn't out of my heart at all. It was just out of my brain, let's get a cure. Let's get a drug that will extend his life. And so it was more of a selfish motive. Um, but after five years of living as if Jerry was dying, we really got tired of the death sentence. We thought, you know, he's made it to that mark of five years. We're going to start living like we're living. And so we made a decision to keep donating that money for the other families that might not reach that five-year mark if we didn't have more research done. So then it became a lot more mm -hmm. to help others. Yeah, it kind of so, moved from the head to the heart Yeah, pretty fast. Almost everyone we met with his diagnosis has died. So he's really... 13 years, so we're happy yeah. about that. So. Yeah, 13. Amazing. Right. Well, we're glad you're here. Thank you. Yeah, it's an <laughs> incredible story. Yeah. So you had gone to this conference about generosity, then you have a diagnosis of cancer. Foster Group at the time was growing. You had introduced some new shareholders and partners to the firm. I think you were experiencing some freedom, at least, you know, to maybe think about other things. And so... All these things coming together, I, I think they just influenced your decision to become even more focused about generosity and how to become more intentional about that. You developed a tool to kind of help you guys think about it. I know you're going to walk us through that here, but I, I just think the context is so interesting how, like you said, Nancy, you just kind of backed into it, and this is mm -hmm. where you were. So right. tell us how that worked yeah, we, out. We wanted to get a better handle on, on how we're investing because even that one decision, we just kind of made this decision of how we we're going to do it, but we didn't really understand the why behind it. Mm -hmm. So I, I thought, what would happen if we'd start looking at our giving as social investing, social capital? And what would happen if we'd give it the same kind of attention as we do when we look at our 401k or investment portfolios from Schwab or TD or whatever? What would happen if we'd really think about that with the same kind of intentionality? And so I just uh, I sat down and just started kind of fiddling around with that, and, and that's when I came up with this chart that you see here. So I, you know, I'll explain it briefly. Across the bottom is kind of where you invest location, and you, you're kind of looking at, are you doing that for individuals? Are you doing that for community? Are you doing, is it going to state, U.S., and international? And then the axis going up, the, the vertical one is the basic human needs, starting with the, you know, your uh, food, water, shelter, Safety, security, you know, uh, health, I think, I'm, I'm trying to read them there myself. So <laughs> education, employment, uh, personal spiritual growth, arts and culture. And so you could take any investment. So now you're going to see me shift here. I've been talking about giving. But so in my mind, when I talk about, when we talk about our social investing, it's an investment. We no longer look at it as a gift or donation we look at it as an investment in wherever it is we think we're going. And so this helped us to kind of look at that. And you could take any of your, any of your investments, your social investments, and you could put it somewhere on this chart. And so we started looking at ours and just saying, okay, what does it look like? And at first we thought we we're gonna use this as a tool to help us decide how to invest going forward. But we began to discover that it's, it's a little hard to put your investments, your social investment, the giving into a box it's just, well, like with, like with my cancer, there's too many emotional things involved. There's too many issues with passion and circumstances. So what it is, it really helped us kind of look at kind of where we've been and what does it look like. Mm -hmm. Right. So you can see up there that we were doing some work in Guatemala that would be the basic needs of food, water, shelter. But this chart showed us how we were really not doing anything for the poverty in our city. So the orange dots that go in there now are what we've added since then. It showed us that we should be open to um, saying yes when we were asked to be on a board together for Change Course. And it's an organization that helps people um, come out of their um, financial poverty. 
If they will do the work, they'll help them with career and um, personal development over six months time. And then they help them find jobs that are above poverty level pay that give them a chance for career um, advancement and pay raises. So none of the jobs are McDonald's. They're all jobs in fiber optics and things like that. So we've had 20 graduates now from that program that are all doing amazing. So um, brand new program. Yeah. But that helped us do that. And then so our, through our South Sudanese friend, we've just, she's opened the doors for the Dinka community that's in Des Moines. So we've done a lot with transportation and helping to connect the kids with um, financial and um, medical and even legal help. We've had to find attorneys to help them with some things. So it's just been fun to build uh, friendships with them, with people that want the American dream and they're willing to work hard for it. So it's been really rewarding. I think I, what I really like about this graphic and the way you guys went through it was it, <laughs> initially, like Jerry, you said, you were going to use it to target something. One of the things I was doing when I was kind of preparing for this is I think you know, there's 1.8 million nonprofits mm -hmm. in the United States alone. So the idea of giving to everything is pretty much impossible. Right. Yeah. So we're going to make some narrowing decisions along the way. And I think you both had an intuitive sense of, okay, we know that's true. So how are we going to do it? Mm -hmm. and, and this was a great tool, first thinking about how to, but then using it really to just help identify where are we really interested. Right. Mm -hmm. And Nancy, you would say, I, I know we talked a little bit about this, where you were thinking of some things that you said, hey, these are things that I, we talk about as being important, but mm -hmm. we don't seem to be doing anything there right. quite yet. So it did talk, have no really <laughs> two, you know, it did have two sides to that, which is great. But I, this, uh, this distinction, I, there's a quote that I really like by a guy named Frederick Beekner, and he says, the place God calls you to is the place where your deep gladness and the world's deep hunger meet. Mm -hmm. He was writing about calling or vocation, but I think for you guys, it's kind of that idea of these are things that you wanted to be a part of right. and a place where there was really some, some need right. in the world. And so it's been a, a fun one, mm -hmm. really fun. So um, here's the thing. Uh, these charts are on your... Uh, chairs. And for those of you who are online, you can actually download a copy of this. And so uh, Jerry's going to walk us through just a way, you know, we've heard about how he did it, but he's just going to give you a quick recap of how you might use the same tool if you're trying to identify some of these same yeah. things in your own circumstance. Jerry. Yeah. What, what I would do is I would take that and, and make some copies so you have some to just uh, play around with, maybe give it to your kids or whoever. But um, and do, and do the same thing we did. Just first of all, make a list of all the things that you have invested in socially. Now, we didn't include in here, like if we wrote a $100 check to a, someone in our church and went on a mission trip. You know, you can really crowd your, uh, your uh, space there with all that. We, we were looking just at the, the uh, investments that we were making that were, uh, you know, were long-term. They were things that we were doing on a regular basis or were larger gifts. Sometimes it would be a one-time gift, but it was a significant gift uh, from our perspective. And so uh, what I would do is just make a list of them and then just figure out where do they go. And I think what you'll find is it will tell you a story. It will tell you a story about your, your own journey of generosity. And that's what it did for us. It started to tell us a story of where we've been and what do we want it to look like. It didn't dictate what we're going to do, but it informed what we wanted to go forward. So uh, enjoy it. I think you'll have fun doing it. Yeah, yeah, I like that a lot. Okay, so in the front bio, we showed a picture of your family, 15 grandkids currently. Um, I'm on the chase here. I, we're expecting our eighth coming up here, so i got a little ways to go. <laughs> I'm not sure. Keep going. Actually, when I see that picture, I'm like, hmm, I don't know. We'll see. Um, but, it's a zoo. It's a zoo. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But what Finally. we did, or what you helped us to do, is to record some of your grandchildren talking about this idea of generosity. So before we move into the second half here, we're going to watch a video of Jerry and Nancy's grandchildren mm -hmm. talking about the lessons of generosity that they're catching from the two of you. Yeah. So Blake? I would define generosity as maybe like helping people, giving people stuff, money or maybe toys or something they need. Letting another person that wants that thing, um, just if they want it, then you can just give it to them. I think generosity means where you give someone something, even though they may not deserve it, or but you give it to them anyway. 
you're being generous. I forgot. Being kind and respectful and like being generous, like with your time and your words. When I was generous, um, I felt good inside and just saying, no, it's mine, you can't have it. It felt really good giving it away. So being generous with your attention could be like you're sitting in the back of math class and you and your teacher is getting kind of boring. You gotta keep, you gotta give her more attention and that can be generous by listening through all she has to say. The only cool gift that I'll give to someone is probably like money, food, water, fun craft supplies, toys. The nicest thing someone's ever done for me is um, I was all alone at recess and um, they walked up to me and he walked up to me and said, do you want to be my friend? We can be generous by asking people questions because it makes them feel more comfortable. Like, how's your day? Or what, what's your favorite color? Or do you have a favorite animal? Well, the ways you can be generous, well, there's many ways. At grandparents camp, we learned about, well, we got this bracelet and it says you can be generous with your influence, money, belongings, thoughts, words, time, and attention. Mm. So just different ways you can be generous. My dad and mom are generous to me because like they're um they um like let us um do some fun stuff like yeah. My sister is generous because like she helps me with my homework. <laughs> oh, <man. laughs> so is that, that was, shameless to for us no, to have a chance so to show fun. our friends? It was really fun, and so so we whittled down. I don't know how much we watched Blake and Hannah and I. We watched all these things and kind of whittling it down. But there were so many <laughs> that were worth including. But we would be here a long time. Very, very, very cute kids. Um, but one of the things that kind of stuck out, I loved it when, you know, your grandson took off the bracelet and talked about grandparents camp. You guys have been really intentional about, okay, how do we make giving part of our family history or conversation, not only with our kids, but with our, our grandkids too. And so, I know right now when we were talking about this, you mentioned a couple things that you're doing right now that you're really thinking about, well, how do we transfer this? So what, what are those things in terms of intentional things that you're thinking about right now? Yeah, so the, the first things we thought about are kind of what we need to do, and then we'll talk more about strategy and doing them. But, uh, you know, what we need to do, uh, three things. One is I think we need to model it. You, you can't teach what you don't practice yourself. And so I think we just have to be uh, really intentional about the, the way we are leading a generous life, that we're doing it in a lot of ways, that we're, we're communicating, uh, communicating that to our, our grandkids, our kids. Um, I, I think one of the things, what, the, the whole issue about modeling is, is we, don't, we don't always get to choose when we're going to have a teaching moment. Hmm. But they're always watching. Not only our kids and our grandkids, but people around us. And so I just don't think we fully understand how much is caught by, the, by what they watch and watch us do. And so, so the first issue is just modeling that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I was at the grocery store the other day and there was a <clears throat> young father with his young son there checking out. And the cashier said, would you like to donate a dollar to the Iowa Food Bank today? And he looks at her and he goes, no, I'm not interested. And I thought, oh, you missed a moment with your son. And then I thought, rats, I missed a lot of those moments too when I was going to save that dollar in the grocery budget and I was going to hurry home. And I did not teach my kids about that sort of thing. So then I thought, well, what would you do different today? I mean, I would say to my little kids, how would you like to feed some hungry people in Des Moines? And you know what they would say? Yeah, mommy, we want to feed them. And so then I would give them the dollar and say, let's have you put it in the collection box. 
and then we would have a great conversation on the way home. But I didn't do that for my kids. I think I saved the dollar. But now for my grandkids, I'm really motivated to do that different. Yeah. Yeah, so the, so the first one's model. Of course, there's a lot more to this that we could talk a long time about each one of these, but we're just giving you a, a quick fly over here. But mm -hmm. the first one is to model. So we model, but then I think the, the next thing that we've really grabbed a hold of is once you model it, you need to be intentional about teaching it. You know, it's important that we intentionally take what we're learning and figure out a way to transfer that to others. I think that's just one of the great um, privileges we have as we grow older is teaching others about things that we're learning. And so um, what we're trying to do is find practical ways that we can do that. Because you know, they just don't want to be taught something. They, they want to they want, to, they want to grasp it through practical ways. And so we've just tried a lot of things like the, uh, the bracelet thing was one thing that Dawson read, all the different ways that we, yeah, right here's the bracelet, and you know, different ways that we can uh, teach uh, generosity. And that actually didn't come from us. We didn't come up with that. It came from uh, I Like Giving, which is, uh, we had to speak here. Brad Formsman had to speak here a few years ago. But, um, and then... Um, and then just making the time. So we go to a grandparents camp. I, I, I know you guys go to the grandparents camp too up at Hidden Acres. Um, and it's a great camp because uh, they, they take care of the lodging. They, they take care of the food. Uh, they take care of the fun uh, activities. Uh, all we get to do is just spend time with our grandkids. And so what we've done every year is had a, a, a theme, you know, theme of what we're going to do. So this last year was generosity. And we, we spent time you know, talking about all of these different ways that we can be generous and just, you know, trying to raise the awareness on the part of our grandkids. Yeah, and, you know, we know that um, kind people are always generous people, but generous people are not always kind people. There's a lot of donations that happen with kind of grumpy people, and we wanted our grandkids to understand kindness. So at one of the, uh, one of our themes was kindness, so we made this incredible homemade bucket called the kindness bucket. Yeah, it says and kindness counts. Kindness counts. And so their assignment each day of our camp was to fill that bucket with pom-poms. And the way they got one was to, to watch one of their cousins doing something kind. And then they would have to, as they put the pom-pom in, tell us what it was. Now, they weren't allowed to put one in for themselves. They tried that, but we didn't allow that. Um, that was cheating. <laughs> so they had to give a witness of it. And once it was filled, they would earn a, um, an event or a treat or something that we did. So they were really motivated to be kind on those three days. We didn't have any trouble with those kids because it was a pom-pom week. So. And it's amazing when they're all come together, they'll say, can we do the kindness jar this weekend? Yeah. So, they, I mean, it's something that they really gravitate yeah, to. Yeah, so they that's want a, the tree that they want the party. We did, a, um, <laughs> we did a movie at the garage party where they had air mattresses and watched a movie in the garage with treats and stuff, and that was so funny for them. Yeah. <laughs> so anyway, so that's the first is the model, the second is to teach, and then the third that we really um, just really gravitated to is uh, how do you transfer it? So you, you model, you teach, and then you transfer it. Um, and here, it, what we're looking for is practical application on how you transfer what, you know, how we transfer what we're learning to them, you know, creating opportunities for them to actually try it out. And so, um, you know, and, and that can be in a lot of ways, just engaging in generous uh, conversations every day with, the, you know, the kindness or the way we treat others. Uh, and it can be monetarily. So one of the things we did uh, along those lines just a few years ago, uh, Nancy and I decided that we would um, ask our adult children if they would help us give away a portion of what we wanted to give away that year from our donor advice fund. And so we, we, they had the amount, and then they uh, were supposed to uh, you know, go, go back home and then think through where they would want that money going and then come back and then we, uh, we uh, kind of reported back to each other what the organization was and why it was important. And, and that, was a, that was a great exercise for us because it really gave us a glimpse of, of what was important to each of them and just helped us kind of understand that. And so that was just a, a practical thing on the financial side. Yeah. So um, we, um, the, to transfer that heart of generosity is our biggest goal and with our grandkids too. So at one of the grandparent camps, we gave them all fanny packs and filled them with little, um, you know, little party favor toys. And their assignment was for each meal at the camp to hand out the toys to the kids there. 
And um, we wanted them to actually be doing some giving where they could see a response from somebody as they gave. So at first they were kind of shy and maybe a couple of them went out and ventured to the tables while the others watched and thought, what's going to happen here? But before long there's 10 kids filtering around, giving toys away and the whole place is talking and laughing and they just saw how much fun it was to make the other children happy. Hmm. You know, you guys are funny. I know you both like to teach. Now, Jerry, I know you like maybe are more comfortable in front of a large group and Nancy, you... We, we coaxed you up here, I appreciate it. <laughs> no, but you more, did. you know, mentoring in small groups and things like that. But you think like teachers, both of you. And so mm-hmm. you tell these stories and they can be kind of like, wow, how do you yeah. come up with all that stuff? Yeah. Recently, you've been working on something called, our, I think a model from, I'll call it the three R's. Right. And I don't mean reading, writing, arithmetic. <laughs> you have three R's that are helping you kind of think about types of giving opportunities that you're transferring or making op- right. you know, opportunities for your family. So. What's the first R? Well, uh, what, we, what we thought about, or it, it, it's one thing to have a philosophy of giving, it's an, and it's another thing to have a strategy for giving. But one of the things I'm finding is that it's really, many people get frozen by the doing, actually you know, figuring out how to do that. Um, and so we just start thinking, well, what are the different ways that we can you know, engage ourselves in that whole generosity uh, process? And so. Uh, that we came with these three R's. So the, the first one is what I call root, it's routine, routine acts of generosity. And you know, this is the, this is the part where you're really uh, developing a habit. You know, it's a habit of giving. It would be um, the, the tithing that you might do to your church. It might be um, you know, going monthly to, uh, to serve meals downtown at the, at the, you know, the rescue, uh, rescue center. It could be a mentoring somebody, meeting weekly with somebody that you mentor. It's, it's building in, in all different lives, you know, places in your life, different ways that you can just create a routine of giving. Yeah. Um, I think we can just choose to routinely do something kind to the checkout person at a store to say something nice. Mm-hmm. Same to a server. When you ask their name, just choosing to make a routine of something that you haven't done before um, and develop a new habit in your life. So when our kids were young, we wanted to develop um, a routine of better communication with them, and we wanted them to, be lear- to learn how to be generous with their words. So it was amazing how any of our children could ever be shy. I don't know <laughs> how that happened, but at home they were just wild and crazy kids but you bring a new person in and they had nothing to say so i would be driving a new friend someplace with them and i would be doing all the talking so i said that's not going to happen anymore we're going to start a five question rule so if we're in the car with a new friend if you don't ask five questions of that friend you can't get out of the car and they were like really mom and so when i'm (laughs) blocking the door for them not to come out they're like she means it (laughs) And then we would say the same for a new guest at our home for dinner. They had to ask five questions or they wouldn't get dessert. So they got amazingly good at asking their questions first because they, the questions get harder as you run out of questions. They want so, the gimmies, the gimmies, yeah. Yeah, so their favorite question, even as you saw with our grandkids, is what's your favorite color? And they would race <laughs> into that one, and now I'm watching it happen with the grandkids. <laughs> yeah. so, it's the layup. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Somebody, somebody would come to our house for dinner, and, they, and the kids would just bombard them just so quick with yeah, questions. Yeah, yeah, get and, it over you know, with. Dinner, and then they would get yeah. up after dessert and leave, and we'd be there with them, and they'd look at us and go, what was that? Uh-huh. <laughs> Yeah, I know. I know. So I, you know, I think it's a real it's a real gift for us to give our kids and our grandkids the gift of asking questions because it's a lost art in our culture today, mm-hmm. and so teaching them that is really important. Yeah, the gift of attention. Yeah, you know that really yeah. says a lot there. Yeah. Okay, so our our one routine. What about our two? So uh, so the second one would be the a radical, the radical acts of generosity, and uh, uh, this one is where you're stepping outside you know your comfort zone. Uh, if it's financial, it would be, okay, what's the largest check that we've ever written to an organization? And then to ask, what's the BHAG? If you've read the book, Good to Great, the big, hairy, audacious goal. What's the, what's the big check that you only imagined that someday you would write? And to write it down and say, okay, that's our goal. That's the thing we'd love to write. And there's a lot of circumstances that come into that, but I'd, we'd love to write that check. And... And then to ask, so what would it take? What's in the way of us getting there? 
I think what I like about that is, is setting a radical goal is that it, when you set that and you start imagining being there and seeing the things that get in the way, you may not hit that goal, but you, you'll get further than you might have if you just live life and let it happen to you. So it's setting those big goals and saying, boy, I'd love that. I'd love to get that. It'd be awesome. Uh, and it's not just about financial. Uh, it can be doing something really radical that's outside your comfort zone. For some people, it might be as simple as going downtown and, and, and serving meals at, you know, at Bethel Mission. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's, that would be a radical move for some people. Uh, it was probably a radical move for any of us when we first did it. Uh, it might be going to a country uh, on a mission trip or a service project that you just never thought you'd imagine doing. Uh, you saw the pictures of Guatemala. That's what it was for us. That was one of those things of saying, let's go do something in another country. And that, that, that stretched us. Uh, and it was a great experience. So, you know, it's just, uh, it's, it's stretching. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think it can change what seemed to be really too scary or too radical before can actually become kind of fun and exciting for us later. We have more life experiences. We maybe are more financially strong. Um, you know, our children are launched, so there's no reason to stay back. So I think those things helped us want an adventure too. But I think um, if we aren't doing some new things, we can become complacent and even boring. So I don't know if you guys are like us, but we're at restaurants a lot where we see couples just quiet with each other. Like they've run out of things to talk about. And I think, well, try something radical, you guys. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> try it. So. It, yeah, we're not going to, we won't call you boring. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no. Good. All right. Yeah. So routine, radical, stretch. What's the last one? Okay, this is the fun one. Mm -hmm. So this is, the, this is the, um, the random acts of generosity. And so it, it, this is the fun one because it's a spontaneous one. You're just kind of watching what's going on around you. Now, for all of the financial planners in the room, shut your ears on this part, okay? Because, <laughs> because the, the, the uh, spontaneous ones, the random acts, are generally not tax deductible. Okay, so yeah, you, now you could, yeah, you can listen now again, but, uh, but yeah, it's the one that you just do because it's the right thing to do, not because it's part of a tax planning strategy. You know, it's, it, it's, it's walking around with, with cash and looking for an opportunity to be encouraging. Uh, we, we've, really, uh, we've really done this in a way that's just been so exciting. Uh, you know, just Nancy and I carry cash around and, and watching, uh, just look for opportunities. Uh, and we start thinking, why is that so difficult? So we, we actually did a generosity project. We call it a generosity project with our family. So a couple of years ago, in August, we were all together. And so we uh, said, okay, we're going to give money. We're going to give them money this time rather than ask them to give our money away. But, we're, but what we're going to do is we're going to say, you, we're giving it to you in cash. So we gave it to them in cash, all in small bills. It doesn't matter what the amount is. It can be anything. Uh, and we had these rules around it. It can't go to a 501c3. It can't go to an organization. You, you have to give your own away, so you can't have a spouse give yours away too. Uh, it can't be to anybody you know, and it can't go to all, all to one person. So there was some pretty strong parameters around that. And we said, we're going to get back together at Christmas, and we're going to talk about your experiences. And we get back to Christmas, and it was really fun to see some of the commonality of it. The first thing is it was really hard to give it away. You'd think that'd be easy, just go give money away. But it's really hard. Because it's vulnerable, it's risky, it's like, well, what happens if they say no? Or what happens if they get mad? I mean, there's all these things that run through our heads. So all of us, including the two of us, had a hard time giving the money away. The second thing that happened is we asked them to encourage, to involve their, their kids, our grandkids. And uh, the stories we heard back is that if they involved their grandkids, it became much easier. Because they didn't have any inhibitions, any inhibitions. They would just see the need and thought, let's go, let's go meet it. And so they, they began to see their grandkids doing it. And they learned, we learned from the little ones, you know, on how, what it looks like to be generous. And, and so that, that was kind of a fun experience. Um, and um, so, so we did that when we shared the stories. The other thing that happened is we started talking about things that were really hard to talk about. Like, what do you do with the, the homeless person on the side of the road that's out with the sign? We all have certain... Uh, certain mindset of what we think about those. We we're already think things about what they're going to do. And you know what? It's probably right. But we talked as a family and we, we, we talked about, is it our right to make that decision or to, 
to have that, um, you know, that, that mindset about what they're going to do, uh, which led us then to go and have a conversation with Hope Ministries downtown and just ask them, what do we do with this? And they said, well, the first thing you need to understand is most of those people, most of them are mentally ill or addicts and most likely will never be able to have a job. So you just have to understand that in the first place. So you take away some of those expectations that they're going to take money and go make a life for themselves. No, they're just learning how to survive. So, so they helped us understand that. And then they said, if you're going to do that, you, uh, here's, here's how they encourage us to engage them is when you pull up on a corner, you see someone there, um, ask them their name. The name, our personal name, is one of the most powerful words that we can ever hear. And for many of those people, they never hear their name. And in fact, if, if they hear their name, it's usually some sort of a nickname, that, but they never hear their name. And um, I've never had anybody give me a nickname. They've always given me their actual name. Well, I'm mean, assuming it's not a name. I, I'm assuming <laughs> that Jim, Paul, you know, Joe mm -hmm. you know, are all real names, but they, um, they give us, so ask their name and then ask them a question, does anybody know you're here? And then the third thing is, how can I pray for you? Now, you're thinking, you're doing that all at a stoplight? It's amazing what you can get done in 30 seconds or 60 seconds at a stoplight. But then what they did is they said, um, if you want to really help them, so they have these cards here uh, that, we, that we've got, and it, it's got all their information, when meals are served, uh, they, they can get a, a warm bed, hot meal, they can get all kinds of services. All they need to do is call, and they'll come get them. And so we, we tell them that they hand that with the $5 bill, which is enough that might get them a, you know, a hamburger or whatever. But we just tell them, hey, uh, here's some money to help out. There's some information. If you really want help, give them a call. They'll come get you. And so that, that, that took away for us just that, you know, trying to figure out, okay, is this person really going to use the money the way we thought? It, it doesn't matter. What we figured out, well, one thing we found is that giving randomly like this um, was more about us than it was the people we're given to. Because I felt like we were being challenged in our own generosity mindset, and that, that was a really powerful thing we learned. Yeah, yeah. So we had some really good conversations with our adult kids with that. We also covered immigration, so can you imagine these conversations? So at the end of that you know, intense conversation, I decided I was going to let the government decide who gets into our country because it was bigger than me and I wasn't going to care about that anymore. It's their job. And once those immigrants came here, it was my job to love them. And I thought, that's something I'm better at than standing guard on a border. <laughs> so I'm just, I'm just going to love them. And that philosophy really helped me out one time when randomly I'm at the grocery store. Again. Again. <laughs> I like to go to the grocery store, I guess. Um, and there's this African grandmother in all of her African colorful... Um, tribal outfit. She was beautiful. And she's um, collected all these baby things to pay for. She has formula and um, juice and serum and all that. And she's got her WIC checks, the women, infant, child checks, and she's planning to pay that with her coupons. And the cashier says, I'm sorry, ma'am, this formula is too big, so you, you're going to have to put that back. And the African woman didn't understand why her checks wouldn't work, and she was so frozen that the line started to back up, and the cashier started to get really frustrated. And so I said, you know, ma'am, why don't you just let me buy her groceries today? And she looks at me and she says, no, she knows what those WIC checks cover, and she can put that back and get a smaller one or just put it back. And I'm watching her, you know, in her purse, going through quarters and thinking, how am I going to do this? Why are the WIC checks not working? Mm -hmm. And so then I look at the cashier and I said, with a lot more strength this time, <laughs> I said, no, really, I want to pay for her groceries. And so she's so frustrated with me, but she knows there's a lineup now. So she puts my food through. And so I go to the end with the African woman collecting her groceries, and she's got tears in her eyes, and then I get tears in my eyes, and I'll do it again now. <laughs> but she gives me a big hug and says, thank you. And I hug back, and I say, um, I'm so glad you're here, and I'm glad I could help you today. So it was a big moment. I might have to cry. <laughs> What a good, yeah, that's yeah. the emotion. Yeah, it was sweet. It was yeah. a sweet moment. Yeah, I, so here I would say three, you know, three things. Everything, everything comes to three. So <laughs> three things about um, about random generosity. First is that uh, be ready to give some extra cash. 
-hmm. Just be ready. And, and, and you, whatever it is you give, you're not going to miss it. I'm, you're just not going to miss it. But the potential impact that it has on another person is really, is really big. Second thing is, is we just try to carry cash all the time. We, we just try to carry cash so that we're ready for the opportunity when it presents itself. I mean, how many times have we thought, oh, I wish I oh, don't have any cash. So we just, I'm just making a habit to have cash, which is kind of interesting in today's world because everything's done with debit card and credit card. Nobody carries cash anymore. So, mm -hmm. so it's, it, you have to be really intentional with it. So, and the third thing along with that is a, a tip um, handed to a server, whatever it might be, with a word of encouragement. We found that to be so incredibly powerful. Um, because the money is great, but the words of encouragement are what they really, so many of us, met, all of us want words of encouragement. We were up at Mackinac this, this summer uh, for our 45th anniversary, and we were up there, and um, there was a uh, kind of a customer relations person there. It was this woman. I just, she was so friendly, so, uh, we just felt like we we're welcome at Mackinac, you know, it was just amazing, and she was helping us, and we got all done, and, and um, so we handed her a $20 bill, and we said, you know what, we just need to tell you, you are, you are one of the most generous people with your, with your spirit and the way you greet people, and we just, we just want to tell you thank you. And she started crying. And she told us she's a teacher, she's there for the summer. It was the end of her, she'd been there all summer, and she looked at it, she says, you're the first, one, first person that's given us, that's done this all summer. Mm -hmm. And, but, what, and then, but what we knew by her reaction is it wasn't the $20. It was the words that she was, that, that, that impacted her because we noticed. So I would just say all of it matters. And, and, but most, you know, another important thing about this is after you're done, you, you get to put a pom-pom in there. Kind yeah, of, yeah, we all can do that. <laughs> That's can. pretty fun. Yeah. Uh, I like the range of stories. I mean, you guys have had everything from the small things, the, you know, $5 here and the much larger gifts, and they're all meaningful for different reasons. Yeah. So I, before we, we've got just a few minutes left here, and I, we're going to try to give a little bit of room for questions. I don't know, Jay, if you got any uh, questions that you think are just like, hey, we should have this question asked? Because if you don't, I've got a couple left, but <laughs> anything that, so this texting, anybody has put anything in, you have anything that you want to? Bring up or sure, but go ahead with your questions. Well, we're <laughs> we're just running out of time. I'm watching this clock. Yeah. yeah, I talked with Blake a little bit. So I'm Jason, and I work with Kent and these two. Uh, we there's there's questions you could answer, um, but I want to say something first. This has been really great, and I'm feeling very emotional listening to you Good. too. <laughs> and. One of the things that's really great about it is when I hear you two talk right now, it's like, I feel like the world's kind of mean right now. And my heart's getting soft when I listen in. And I think, oh, that's the kind of person I want to be. I want to be a person who goes into the world with a soft heart. Mm -hmm. um, maybe some of you are feeling this too. So I just wanted to say that first and say thanks for that. Um, I, you get to choose the question. I'll, I'll say a few. You can choose. <laughs> so one I'm curious about, and I know you two well enough that, that I know it's a little bit hard to tell these stories, but do you have a favorite story of giving? Or do you have something that rises to the top that was like, I mean, you've told some that are really great. Yeah. Are there any others that you're like, this was great. I loved this. Well, I think the African woman was my favorite. I think that's why I still cry when I say it, because I loved the culture. I loved how vulnerable she was, and then how grateful. So, you know, I asked you guys this, with that question about what was the most generous act or giving or something really generous that you mm -hmm. think has been done for you, and it was interesting because you both had. Well, I won't spoil it. Yeah. Yeah. What was the answer? Yeah. 
Well, um, when our twins were, three and a half pound twins were first born, um, Jerry took a job where it was only commission selling office supplies. And I mean, how much was your first check? I don't know, $132. $132. Anyway, we, we were crashing yes. fast. <laughs> and I was home with them because they were preemies and all. And we just didn't have enough money for food for the next week before payday. And somebody from our church just came to our house and said, we don't know why we're here, but we feel like we're supposed to give this to you. And it was just, I mean, it bought our food for the next week. And it was, probably wasn't that much money, but for us, it just came at such a, a very vulnerable time. And, you know, as hard as that is, I think it's good for us to be in that place once in a while to appreciate what so many people around us live with every day. And that is, will I eat? Right. Yeah. Yeah, it's interesting. I mean, when you ask that question, we have a lot of things that people have been generous. I mean, mm -hmm. we feel like we've been yes. on, the, on the receiving side of generosity. But when we ask that question, I go to the exact same story. Mm -hmm. Which, uh, of all the things, I mean, I'm, I'm guessing it was probably less than $50. I mean, this is, this is 45 years ago. Mm -hmm. So I, I'm guessing it was less than $50, but we remember that. Mm -hmm. What's interesting is, this is really interesting. We don't remember who the couple is, mm. but we remember the $50. Mm. And um, I don't know what that says, <laughs> other than that, that the small acts that we, we, um, we can do for other people can have lasting impact beyond anything that we can imagine. And it doesn't really matter who does it, it's just the act itself is so powerful. Mm -hmm. and, it, and, and that's the memory both of us have is one of the most generous things that somebody's done for us. I really, I really like that one. The yeah. fact that you both thought of the same story and it was yeah. from long ago, relatively small. It just, it really talks about, you know, it's not necessarily the size of the gift, but sometimes yeah. the timeliness, you yeah. know, yeah. Right. the right time for the right gift makes right. a huge impact. Yeah. yeah, yeah, for sure. So anyway, thank you all for, for being here. We're gonna be wrapping up here and I know you guys are gonna stick around a little bit. So if, you know, in the live audience here, if you have any questions or wanna, talk with Jerry and Nancy, they'll be around for a little bit. Um, quickly here, as we wrap up today, I just want to take a minute to thank Dimensional Fund Advisors. Dimensional has been a partner with Foster Group for about 25 years or more, and they've just been a great partner in helping us to have events like this. So um, thank you to Dimensional. I, uh, their founder, David Booth, there's a quote that I've been thinking about lately um, that he is attributed with. He says, the antidote to uncertainty is educated optimism. Mm -hmm. And I like that idea. We, we try to do both at Foster Group. We like the idea of an educated optimism. And I think in listening to you guys today, hopefully this has been educational, a little bit about generosity, but also provided a degree of optimism about what kind of things can happen in terms of what good can be brought into the world when we just act. You know, there's reasons to be optimistic about that. So thank you. And at, at Foster Group, you know, our our team, we try to be driven by three values of care and competence. Um, <laughs> I space on the third one. Care, character, and competence. This is where I'm really good, right here on a piece <laughs> of paper. Um, but the idea here is we, we are so interested in trying to provide wide, wise financial counsel, but in a way that makes people feel truly cared for. That's important to us, and I think it comes right out of how you know, the two of you live, and that's transferred into the company. Um, so in times of uncertainty, I know people are kind of looking for advice. If you have some questions, if you're watching online, you'd have just would like to meet with a financial advisor. We, of course, would love to do that. We don't um, take commissions or a fiduciary kind of mindset. So we really just have your best interests at heart. And uh, we think that gives us a great opportunity to, to serve people every day. And we enjoy doing that very much. So uh, that will end the online portion of this thing. So I think Thank you for watching.